I'm super excited to kick off Dreamforce with all of you. So thank you so much for joining me this morning, 8 a.m. first Dreamforce session of the week. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I'm super excited that you all are here for because the content that I present and share with you today, I believe you'll be able to use throughout the rest of the week. Um, so you're starting off Dreamforce correctly. <laughs> Um, so I'm here today to talk with you about how admins are critical change agents. I'm Liz Hellinga. I'm a sales operations manager at Silverline, and I'm also a Salesforce MVP. Admins sit at the center of change within their organization, or actually most Salesforce professionals. So if you're, how many in here are admins? Cool. How many are developers? Wow, awesome. Business owners of it? The platform? Okay. Admins truly sit at the center of change for organization, and I'm, I will share with you some things that will help you enable change better within your organization. But before we get started, forward-looking statement. <laughs> well, for all the Dreamforce newbies, this may be the first time you see this slide, but this is um, Salesforce's statement that you should make your purchasing decisions based on products that are commercially available right now. So I don't think I'll be talking about any future products for Salesforce during this presentation, but just keep this aware throughout your entire week at Dreamforce. Change is inevitable. And I joke around that it's said by lots of people. You hear it all the time. Um, change is happening, change is coming. Yet why is it so difficult for so many of us to adopt change. Um, we deal with it every day in our organizations, even at home um, with our friends and family. I mean, the reason I'm so passionate about talking about it with you today is because I've, I've learned some things. I've been an admin for over five years in the Salesforce ecosystem, and you know, I've built some really cool things, and I've had some success and I've also had some failure. And just recently, within the last year, um, I joined Silverline back in October and they asked me when I joined, they said, we got to optimize Lightning. So how many of you are on Lightning? Okay. And so they had flipped the switch on Lightning, but we had had some changes in our organization. So they said, we need to optimize it for the sales team. And we're like, yes, we are going to get on Lightning and be awesome with it. And we started to run a great project, right? We met with all the stakeholders, we gathered all the requirements. One of the requirements from our stakeholders was to move a process that was existing outside of Salesforce into Salesforce. So we built this, I mean, we, we built something really cool and we did a lot of right things. And we went through our sprints fast, we had no issues, we launched on time. And then about two months later, we found out that that process that we had built in Salesforce was not being used. Whew, that was a, and I was, I was put, gonna put that on my performance appraisal because I was so excited about migrating that process to Salesforce. I mean, it was gonna be like one of my highlights of the year. Well, I mean, we're still working through it, but when we went and looked back at what we did, we realized that it wasn't that we didn't run a great project. It was that we didn't enable the sales team to be successful on it. We didn't get, we didn't use change management skills to change how they were approaching this process. And that's why they were still doing it outside of the system. So needless to say, we worked on that. And um, I've used some of these skills to get them on board with it. But, you know, I want you all to benefit from some of my failure and because you all build really great things. You, you know, your task within your organization, your company, is to utilize the platform to streamline business processes and make the company more efficient, ultimately serve your customers better, right? Or your constituents, or if you're a nonprofit. Um, so change is inevitable. All of us here at Dreamforce, your company is investing in you to be here. And all week, you will be learning things 
to that will you'll need to change your organization with them, right? You're going to go out and you're going to be like, I got to go like implement this new process that I learned, or I learned this new um, you know formula that can help the team. But in order to be able to you know enable those great ideas, you need to use change management skills, and that's what we'll talk through. So before we start, we have to have a working definition of change management. It's the set of tools, resources, processes, skills, and principles for managing the people side of change to achieve the required outcome of your project or initiative. And I emphasize people because that's really what change management involves, is connecting with your stakeholders and your end users to make sure that they can adapt the change. This definition is from ProSci, which is one of the largest change management organizations in the world. Um, so you, I have a reference here, and it'll be in the slides that are posted in the, in the app. But um, I would look into them, because they do offer change management certi certificates if you're interested. The other reason that I'm passionate about change management skills is that I think combined with your Salesforce skills, like your rockin' Salesforce skills, you can be a true change agent within your company. You get to not only automate processes and improve things for your end users and your customers, but you can make organizational change if you start to use change management skills. And I know that change management sometimes has a negative connotation, so I want you all to go on this little journey with me and I want us all to say no to change management and say yes to change enablement. Because we're not like trying to, you know, change people or manage people or force people to do things. We're trying to enable them to be more successful. And that's what your role is as a Salesforce admin. You're constantly rolling out things that you can change for your company. You may not even realize that you're using change management skills right now. How many of you read the release notes? OK, you guys are awesome. The rest of us watch the podcast and read the blogs. <laughs> but when you're, when you're thinking through each new release and how it will impact your org, you're, you're, you're employing change management skills. You're thinking about how you can improve your organization by taking advantage of the three releases each year. So I want you all to think of yourselves as change enablers. So let's remove change management and think, you are agents of change. You can be the change enabler in your organization. And I guarantee that if you start to use change management skills and build it into a repeatable process within your company, you will be recognized for it. What happened to me when I first started off in my solo admin role is that I had to completely overhaul the sales process um, globally. And it was a very, it was a big project, important project within the first three months of me accepting the position. And I ran such a great project that, I mean, not to pat myself on the back, but <laughs> what happened was is that another stakeholder, when they were going to implement another technology, tapped me on the, the shoulder and said, you did a really good job with this. Can you help our team with this? And I ended up leading another project for a completely different department. Um, and it was, I owe it to my project management and change management skills that I was able to do that. And I hope that you know, after you all start to practice these that you'll enjoy some of those same things. So change is on a scale. And a lot of times when we think about change management, we are focused on the radical end of that scale. We're thinking about implementing a CRM globally, you know, an ERP system, something that impacts every single employee, right? But a lot of times as Salesforce admins, we spend our time on the lower end of the scale, you know, from incremental to about the middle. We're not always completely overhauling an organization. We're not always implementing radical change. But using change management skills or change enablement skills 
on the lower end of the spectrum starting now will allow you to build that foundation of of tools so that people come to expect and understand what you're going to um, bring to each project. And your stakeholders will trust you. Because one of the most important things, because remember, change management, change enablement is about the people, is trust. As change becomes more radical, the need to build trust increases. We've all experienced projects where we had a sort of a distrust for them, especially ones that impact an entire organization. Starting to add change management skills, best practices early, you know, not early on, but in the smaller or lower scale of change, you build that foundation of trust. And what that means is that your stakeholders and end users will follow you on a journey for more radical change when it's needed. So where do you begin, right? So on this next slide, not this slide, but the next slide, I'm gonna show you five things. And I want you, if you have paper and pen, to write them down or take a picture of them because those five things I want you to think about the rest of the week while at Dreamforce. And maybe you just pick one of the five things to focus on that we're gonna talk about, but at least pick one. I'd love it if it was all five. But five best practices. So where do we begin? There are five ways that you are able to affect change. Camera's up. <laughs> Number one, understand the why. And each one of these will get a slide or two, so um, with more detail. Understand the why. Planning. Um, we spend a lot of time technical planning, right? We, we do Visio or we do Lucid charts. We do a lot of requirements gathering. Um, but I'm talking about planning around the change, how it's going to impact your, your stakeholders and end users. And stakeholders, they, they are the people part of change management, so we need to talk a lot about them. Today, uh, we'll talk about communication and empathy and listening. And if you can pick just one or two of those this week, I guarantee that when you go back to your company next week, you'll have ideas on how you can enable that change, the, the cool changes, the brilliant things you're gonna learn this week, how you can enable those for your organization. So let's dig into it. Understanding the why. You have to understand the compelling business case, even for some of these small changes like moving a field across a page or down or up a page, which fields you decide to include in sales path when you're migrating to Lightning. You have to think through what specifically is happening. And I would ask you to always craft one to two sentences about that change. We have all been the recipient of communication that says, when you ask, why are we doing this? And they say, well, because the VP wants it. We all know how unsatisfying and infuriating that can be for us. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that. And, what the, and as you, as a Salesforce administrator, Salesforce professional, as you're trying to build trust so that you can get more people to hop on the change journey with you, that's not going to cut it, saying that because so-and-so said so. So having one to two sentences in your back pocket at the ready at the coffee machine or a lot of times we all chat before our conference calls kick off, having that available will just get, build more confidence for you and for the people that you work with. We're going to dig into business case development, but I'm highlighting it here because it's, it's a key business skill for Salesforce administrators. And I'll share some components of it that you can um, start to use. But I had no idea when I became a Salesforce administrator that I would spend a significant amount of time writing business um, cases, you know, advocating for things. For example, when I took that first sales, solo Salesforce administrator job, I had to develop a business case for our CEO so that we could um, upgrade to enterprise. And to me, it was like, duh, why wouldn't we be on enterprise? Um, but obviously, to our CEO, it was not like that. 
Um, so I started to develop the business case and I had to present it to him within the first 30 days of being hiring and that was nerve wracking. Not as nerve wracking as being here, but a little nerve wracking. Um, so business case development, uh, start to practice it. And it, sometimes it could be a paragraph, sometimes it can be pretty significant, a couple of pages or a presentation. So all good business cases start with data. What, is the, what are you trying to change? Why does it need to change? For example, let's say your customer response time went from 12 hours to 24 hours. Ooh, that's alarming, right? We, nobody wants us to, I mean, 12 hours is kind of bad in this day and age, but um, you need data to understand what is happening there. Like, is it the process? What's causing that change? Why are people doing that? Are they short-staffed? Are things not routing correctly? Develop and, and pull together that data and start to analyze it. The other thing that you need is a well-defined problem. And it's not easy to get to the well-defined problem because everybody has an opinion on it. So you have to probably interview a couple people depending on the scale of change, right? Um, so talk with them to understand it, ask a lot of questions, ask more questions, ask another person. Start to define the problem. And if you can get it into a couple sentences, that's great, because then, again, you can easily rattle it off when necessary. The other thing that a business case needs is a sense of necessity, like the urgency around it, right? Like, we're losing customers because our calls, you know, our response time is now 24 hours um, versus it was 12 hours, you know, two months ago or something like that build out that necessity of change. Like, why do we need to do it? What's the urgency? What's the impact? But this last one is a pretty big one, the risk of complacency, the status quo. What if we don't change? And you will hear that a lot. People will always say, well, you know, I'm fine doing this process this way. I'm not ready to change. I don't, you know, you get a lot of resistant. Being able to talk about what happens if you choose not to make that change, how that will impact the end user, the department, the company, and ultimately the organization, the, um, the clients that you, or your customers. I, you know, at Silverline, um, I just, just recently, I had to like talk about the risk of not doing something, the risk of status quo. I wanted, to, I wanted to attend a conference. They're investing, right, in me being here at Dreamforce. And then I said, hey, I want to go to this like sales enablement conference in November. And they were like, can you outline the risk of uh, why of not going, what it would mean to Silverline? And I was like, oh, sure. <laughs> Let me just pull out my, my business case work. Because um, I thought I had already developed a pretty good business case. So. These are components, and it could be a sentence or two each. Depending on the scale of change that you're looking to do, it could be a page, it could be a couple slides. Um, your stakeholders will help you sort of figure out how much information you need. And this is something that I, you should constantly practice. How many of you in here have had to do business cases before? Awesome. All right, good. Can't stress enough, business case. Planning. I recommend building a repeatable plan, especially for some of the things that you work on on a regular basis. Like maybe you build out a repeatable plan for change enabling around the release time. You know, figure out what your goals are. What's your? What are your objectives? What does success looks like? What does success look like when you adapt this change or make these you know changes to the or, your org? Have a clear vision. Again, one or two sentences around the vision. Bonus points if you can align the vision to any corporate vision or objectives. Your, your higher up stakeholders will love that. Um, Again, you need to know who your stakeholders are, and we, they, get, they get a whole section in here today, so we'll be able to talk through that. But the stakeholders, uh, you need to, they're everywhere. <laughs> and communication, a communication plan as part of your change management plan is imperative. We tend to under communicate about the business objectives around the business case and we tend to over-communicate around the technical stuff. 
which we all love to talk about, all the great technical things that we do, but sometimes our business owners are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so that's why using the business case will really help you with some communication. Stakeholders. Who are they? How do we find them? Why do they care? <laughs> um, the Project Management Institute lists stakeholders as anyone who has an interest in your project or change. You may not think that they should have an interest in your project. We've all had that. They're like, why do they care about what I'm doing? Um, and that usually blows up in my face if I forget somebody like that <laughs> or try to ignore them. Um, and they're usually the angry callers or emailers. <laughs> um, so think through that. It's anybody who perceives that they have an interest in your project as a stakeholder, as much as we don't always understand it. Um, so it's hard to find them all the time, because sometimes you don't realize, like, oh, I didn't know you would care about this. Um, so what I suggest is that you map out all who touch a process when you're looking to change it, and then think about who they report to or who they work, or who, who they work with. Talk to them. Talk to the people that touch the process to see who else should be involved. It's sort of like Dreamforce parties, right? We all get really upset when we don't get invited to the cool parties. <laughs> Um, that's how some of your stakeholders will feel if you start to implement change and you haven't included them, although they, they may just be more than sad. They may be angry. Um, so use that as an opportunity. You know, use the process. The do while documenting the process, document the people and ask them who else should be involved. And leave no rock unturned. Keep looking for them. You, the worst thing that can happen is that you're about to implement some change and all of a sudden that, like, hidden stakeholder pops up and can derail your, your goals and your objectives and your time frame to meet, meet those. And I also highlight stakeholders as a key business skill. And I didn't realize this early on in my career, but stakeholders are a great way to grow your network. Some of us are introverts, I mean, and having something to actually talk with somebody about within your organization around a project or change is a great way to build relationships. Some of us are not chatty at the coffee you know, pot or at the water cooler or on conference calls. They will grow your network and they can become great advocates, especially when they understand that your internal personal brand is around enabling change effectively. So, they, so getting back to my trust point, is that stake, as the stakeholders start to trust you, they will, your name will be come up, you'll be recognized, people will like tap you on the shoulder for other projects. It's just a great way to grow your career within your company and maybe beyond if necessary, if you choose to. Communication. We are born communicating. <laughs> I don't know why it's so difficult for all of us to still communicate effectively. I'm not sure what, what the case is, but we, we're, we're born screaming, <laughs> most of us. Um, and people, all, people are always, like whenever we're involved in change projects, people will always remember the poor communication. Like, oh, they didn't tell me this, or they didn't tell me that. And it's not an easy th thing you know, to go, to go through, you're all, you're, you constantly have to iterate on communication and tweak it and improve it. So what I recommend is think through your stakeholder registry. Oh, I had forgot one comment I needed to make about stakeholders. Stakeholders, what I recommend too is that for any like process that you have, any like custom objects that you built, Make sure you list out the stakeholders involved in that. And I don't know how many of you are documenting your orgs like rock stars. Okay, I'm still like I'm still trying. But I get if you like use a wiki to document your org or you keep track of changes within Salesforce, list out those stakeholders that are linked to those custom objects. 
because a year later, when you are like looking at changing something in that custom object, you may forget all that was in, all the people that were involved in it or need to be involved in it. And I also have a standard list of stakeholders for things like leads, um, our sales process, and our accounts, so that I always know, like, okay, I got to go through my checklist of who to include with that. So I didn't. I wanted to make sure I made that point. Okay, back to communication. It's important to know who the people are that you're speaking with. So when you look at the stakeholders that are involved in your um, change, think about the three areas that they, the three types of communication they may need. One of them is awareness. Who just needs to know about it? You know, sometimes executives don't always want to get into the nitty gritty, but they kind of need to know what's going on. Um, your manager probably would be one of them. Some, some of the incremental change scale may not need as many people, but awareness is key. Support. So support is important because people that are going through the change, that are physically like clicking and doing something, they need to have like maybe job aids or quick sheets or demos to help them adapt the change. So a little bit more involved than maybe just awareness, right? And then you have the involvement. With every project, um, you will have people that will be working with you in it, and they have to have a different type of communication throughout the change. You need to determine what needs to be communicated. I'm an over-communicator sometimes. Again, I like to tell people all the cool things that I built or that I'm working on. Um, they don't always need to know that, so it's very difficult to rein that in. Um, but I recommend trying to, you know, distill it as much as possible. There's different communication methods, right? You could present to people, you can send emails, chatter. Depending on the scale of the project and the scale of change, you need to think about when and how often. Sometimes the communication can just be like a simple chatter post, like, hey, we added this field or we added this pick list option. Um, other times, maybe the project is like three months long and you need to have communication throughout the entire project to keep people engaged and aware of what's happening. And this last one is important. And especially as a solo admin, I always thought that the messaging should come from me. But the message may not always need to come from you. You may need to have a, you know, a senior ex or executive or manager um, make that communication to your stakeholders. There may be times where it's advantageous for you to have an end user, especially like one of your like super users make the communication because they're on board with the change. So think through, um, you know, how that messaging should come about, like who should communicate it, um, and it may be that you communicate it, a manager communicates it, just start to document it out. So I usually use like a Google sheet to help me you know, look at the stakeholders and their categories and what type of communication they need and how often. And I've actually presented on communication skills at some of the world tours because it is like one of the top soft skills that companies look for. Um, it, it's interesting because I think People take it for granted, but a lot of us are not put through writing class when we get to our jobs. I mean, how many of you have been through a writing class at your job? All right, that's, that's, there's a handful of you. That's great. Um, I was not. I'm developing presentation content. I've never been on a class for that. It's sort of learning as I go. Um, so those are skills that you should constantly refine, and if you pull it into a communication plan around change, you'll definitely... Um, improve those skills. The one thing I say about communication is getting feedback is crucial. Ask people, how happy were you with how we communicated around this change? What would you have improved? What would you have liked to see? Because that will help you to constantly improve it and, you know, make your stakeholders happy because that's, you want your stakeholders and your end users happy. And there's various communication methods. I can't believe I left chatter off of this. <laughs> Um, but town halls, team meetings, newsletters, you could do an admin newsletter if you want to and like highlight changes that you do on a regular basis. You could develop a wiki. Um, 
there's lots of ways that you can communicate. You can get creative with it, especially on some of the larger scale projects, maybe that have more radical change. Um, we're going through something right now, and we even had, um, we developed a logo for our internal project, and it's a yellow Vespa. I mean, it's kind of fun. So communication doesn't always have to be dry, but start with the basics, and then you can build upon it. Empathy and listening is probably one of the best things that you can develop as a Salesforce administrator, right? Because a little bit of empathy goes a long way. We all want to share and understand the emotions and feelings of our stakeholders and end users throughout the process. Because change is never easy. We have, people are making lots of money researching why people can't change. <laughs> so I recommend like click a mile in their shoes. You know, start to try to do some of the processes yourself, but also have them show you some of it. Like, how many of you have heard of Sabwa? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share what Sabwa is. Mike Gerholt, I think he's even done a podcast on it. Sabwa is Salesforce administration by walking around. So I'll repeat it, Salesforce administration by walking around. This is a great way to connect with your stakeholders and start to build relationships, develop trust, and most importantly, develop empathy and improve your listening skills. Um, what that means is that if you are fortunate enough to work in an environment where your end users are out on the floor with you, go walk around and talk to them. If you are remote like I am, like sometimes I have to be like, hey, can I just schedule a Zoom with you to see what you're doing? I need to understand how this, is, how this process is working for you. I want to I wanna watch you click. <laughs> Um, start to develop that, and you will learn so much about the process and how your end users feel about what the Salesforce app is doing for them. And as you develop empathy and improve your listening skills, you, this is probably where you're going to build the most trust. Oops, sorry. Um, this is where you will build the most trust. And you're going to need trust because change is a journey. And it's a defined journey. You can take a picture of this slide <laughs> as I talk through it. So change, we all start on the top left, right? Your top left. Comfort and control. That is the status quo. That's where I'm, I'm grooving in my job. I know how to do it. I'm like a master of my Salesforce process. I can click here and click here. I respond to clients fast. Um, your stakeholders, your end users, all feel in control in this area. And so what I suggest for all Salesforce administrators is to build your brand around change. So when your end users are living in the comfort and control section, talk to them about how you're really the face of change for this, your company. Like your role, your job is to truly be a change agent. You're constantly utilizing the platform to improve processes. That's your role, you're a change enabler. So if you start to talk with people about that, they will start to understand that Liz will be bringing them along a change journey. So that when they, when you announce change, and they will, everybody will go to the fear, anger, and resistance, the bottom left quadrant. I mean, on incremental change, people may not be fearful. They may just be annoyed, right? Like, why do we have to change this? But it's a, it, it, like, this is a state that people move to automatically when change is announced, the majority of people. So the best thing that you can do when you announce change is to open up your ears and listen, listen, listen. So your mantra for your comfort and control is to be like, I'm a change enabler. And then when you get down to the fear, anger, and resistance portion of change, when you just announce it, listen to them. That's where empathy is going to come into play. The more trust that you build as you become, develop repeatable plans and programs around change, they will move out of this stage into the inquiry, experimentation, and discovery. And this is where they're sort of getting hands-on, right? So the things that you can do here in this stage 
to really help them through this as they start to try out the new process, click here, do that, is to make sure that you have great, you know, great um, quick sheets, demos, trainings. Think training, training, training when you're at the inquiry, experimentation, and discovery stage. Um, because this is what they'll need, because you don't want them to ever be frustrated that they don't know what they're doing. Because they won't know what, exactly what they're doing, you just need to be able to guide them through it. And then once you get through it, you get to learning, acceptance, and commitment. And I love this part, because this is like, yeah, project's going great, it's wrapping up. This is the celebration part, so think party, celebrate. Like Whether it's quirky or silly, celebrate the change that is adopted they will thank you for it. They will be grateful for it. Show them the gratitude that they went through this and they accepted this process that they were initially resistant to or annoyed with. Hopefully not fearful. Usually fearful and anger comes around big organizational change. Most of us admins deal with more of like the annoying, like, Ugh, why do I gotta do this change? But as you go through this change journey, you become the change, you are their guide. You are their change leader. So I have about four minutes left, so I want to wrap up quickly and then take a couple of questions if possible. But I want each of you to commit to being the change enabler. So the five things that I asked you to either take a picture of or write down, how many of you have figured out one that you're going to work on this week? Great. There is a trail around change management. So if you haven't hopped on the trail, the um, Drucker School Organizational Change Leadership, it's a, it's a really good one. Um, it's based on John Cotter, who's a famous change enablement writer. There's other online learning platforms like Coursera, Udemy. Um, I would consider certification. Um, I'm, I'm going through the certification process right now through the Association of Talent Development, but ProSci also offers it. And again, commit to focusing on the five best practices throughout this week. And I ask all of you, if you learn something here that is helpful to you, pass it on to somebody else. You know, share, download the slide, share it, um, reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'd love to hear feedback about how you're able to implement these five best practices. Um, have a great Dreamforce. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>